consequences. Joe Biden's warning to Saudi Arabia after Riyadh sided with Russia and other OPEC plus nations agreeing to cut oil production last week. What consequences does Biden mean? For their part, Gulf states argue they're not trying to bankroll the Kremlin's invasion of Ukraine, but prop up a price of crude threatened by the specter of a global recession and slowing demand. A global recession caused by what? Is it really in the self-interest of those Gulf states to boost a run of record profits when Putin's war forces their customers to accelerate the switch away from fossil fuels? Is it the role of the United States, also, by the way, a leading oil and gas producer, to pressure OPEC? More broadly, what's left of that fist bump from last summer in Jeddah between uh, the U.S. president and the Saudi crown prince? U.S. officials in the past days uh, has said they had warned Saudi Arabia that the wind in Washington is blowing against uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Even if Donald Trump does return to the White House in two years, can the kingdom bank on a return to grace, particularly if Russia is still shelling Ukrainian cities? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking, should Saudi Arabia worry? Joining us uh, from Washington, France 24 correspondent, Kedivan Gorgistani. Good to see you. Hi, Francois. From London, Salman Al Ansari, founder and president of the Saudi American Public Relations Affairs Committee. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Francois. Uh, joining us as well, uh, he Philippe Charles, energy researcher at the Sapiens Institute think tank. Good evening. Good to see you. Uh, the France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Uh, we'll take action, Joe Biden's words uh, this Wednesday to reporters confirming the White House is reviewing its relation with the world's top oil producer. This in the wake, again, of last week's decision by OPEC Plus to slash production by 2 million barrels a day. Andrew Hillier has more. After a diplomatic slap in the face from Saudi Arabia, a warning of consequences to come from the U.S. president. We should... And I am uh, in the process when the, when the uh, uh, this House and Senate gets back, they're, they're going to have to, uh, there's going to be some consequences for what they've done with Russia. I'm not going to get into what I'd consider and what I have in mind, but there will be, there will be consequences. That's after the OPEC oil cartel, led by Saudi Arabia, announced it was siding with Russia and its allies to slash oil output. Last week, the group, called OPEC Plus, said it would cut production by 2 million barrels a day from November. That could trigger price rises at the pumps ahead of crucial midterm elections in the U.S. According to the Wall Street Journal, Riyadh pushed ahead with the move, despite repeated warnings from Washington. It brings efforts to ease ties to an abrupt end, just months after that fist bump between Biden and Mohammed bin Salman was supposed to signal a relations reset. Instead, Riyadh's pivot away from Washington is a boost to Moscow. Vladimir Putin has vowed to keep working with OPEC countries, but also insisted the cut wasn't driven by geopolitics. I know your position. Our actions, our decisions are not directed against anyone. We are not doing this to create problems for anyone. Our actions are aimed at creating stability in the global energy markets. Members of OPEC say the move is a response to economic uncertainty. In its first report since the decision to cut output, the oil cartel trimmed its forecast for global oil demand for the rest of the year. Uh, Kedivan Korjistani, uh, we saw reporters earlier uh, at the White House when the, uh, Joe Biden was going off on, a, on a, a trip to the west of the United States asking him, uh, is military assistance uh, going to be reviewed? He, he played his cards close to his chest. Yes, and that's uh, pretty much the messaging that we've been getting for the past couple of days from any White House official uh, that reporters have uh, questioned about uh, what those consequences could possibly entail, whether it was the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, or uh, the National Security Council uh, with John Kirby. Uh, the same response is that they will review uh, the relationship, but they're not getting into the details uh, of what they would do, and they're not even answering some of the options 
options that have been put on the table by Democrats in Congress. Uh, that uh, possibility of freezing arms sales, for example, that comes from some Democrats in Congress who uh, put that on the table, saying that that could be uh, one option. Another option is uh, to possibly sign a bill that would open OPEC countries to uh, U.S. lawsuits for manipulating market prices uh, around uh, the globe for energy. These are things uh, that are uh, on the table, according to congressional Democrats, uh, but that the president and the White House are not wanting to uh, really uh, go into details with this. That's number one. It's the U.S. that wanted to sell LNG gas to Europe with four times the price, not Saudi Arabia, not nor OPEC, nor OPEC Plus. And President Macron, the French president, hinted about his frustration, personal frustration, of the U.S. exploitation of Europe's energy need. This is a fact. And Voltaire actually said it right. Il n'y a pas de vérité moyenne. There are no half-truths. The second thing is the U.S. administration, as we all know, has waged um, a war against its domestic U.S. oil industry through uh, an executive order. Months afterward, he said, the, the Biden administration, Biden himself, at a climate conference, he said Saudi Arabia should be punished for its hydrocarbon production and how Saudi Arabia is exacerbating the climate change. And now he is asking us to pump more oil. And you see the double standards here. The third thing, which is very important and hasn't been very like well reported by the media, which is the fact that the U.S. administration urged Saudi Arabia to delay the production cut for a month. So that tells us what? It tells us that it has nothing <laughs> to do about Russia at all whatsoever. It's all about the midterm elections, which means the U.S. Democratic Party wants the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to middle in the U.S. elections to, to basically help them out. And that's why I said earlier the U.S. ship is too big to fail, but too divided to sell. Uh, it, it is, though, the case, Salman Ansari, that uh, we have seen escalation after escalation from Russia, Russia which stands to profit uh, from that oil uh, revenue. It's, it's the escalation after escalation that matters in this case, does it not? And it's not in Saudi Arabia's interest uh, for Russia to be at war with Ukraine, is it? Not at all. Actually, Saudi Arabia, two weeks ago, the U.S. administration itself thanked the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman for his personal efforts to mediate between the two Vladimirs, Putin and Zelensky, and managing to release American and European war prisoners. It was just two weeks ago. It was a huge step. You can call it symbolic, but at the end of the day, it's actually very important. Specifically, it might activate Saudi Arabia to do more efforts with regards to uh, uh, working to mediate between the two uh, uh, powers so we don't get into a third world uh, war scenario. And, and I'm not exaggerating here. It's actually a very possible thing. And Saudi Arabia has actually uh, sided with the UN a statement against taking um, lands by force. So Saudi Arabia has been very clear about its rejection of the Russian uh, step to invade Ukraine. But does that mean Saudi Arabia is going to take sides in this specific conflict or better for Saudi Arabia to be in a mediation kind of uh, mode so they can actually find a way through which we can actually prevent this from escalating. And Saudi Arabia, at the end of the day, all what they want is stability for the market. And let's not forget, it's not only Saudi Arabia that decided to do the cut of production. And by the way, no import, no exports will be actually cut. It's also only about the production per se. So there is no effect. And even the prices of oil has actually decreased almost two to three percent after the decision of the production cut. So we have to think carefully about, as I said earlier, we have to differentiate between gas and, and, and oil. And there is something very important. And Adam yeah. Smith, uh, the congressman, Adam Smith, he is a Democratic congressman. He was actually urging uh, Biden yesterday 
to not make any other further mistake with Saudi Arabia. And he's from the Democratic Party. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me ask just briefly before I turn to our, to our panelists here on set. Let me, let me just ask Kedavan Gorgistani very briefly, Kedavan, about this, that one point that uh, how much of this is about domestic politics in the U.S. and uh, keeping the price at the pump low, Americans who need their cars ahead of those November midterm elections. Of course, it's a, a very big part. It might not be uh, the most public uh, part of uh, the messaging from uh, the White House or even from Democrats, for that matter. They uh, prefer to uh, insist that this is a retaliation for uh, Saudi Arabia uh, siding or helping out uh, the Russians. But of course, the midterms are coming up and it is a uh, key. They are worried that there is going to be uh, skyrocketing uh, gas prices uh, just uh, before those uh, midterms, those crucial midterms uh, for the Democrats. And uh, that is why uh, I would agree with what your guest said about uh, that uh, this is uh, completely political for the Americans. Uh, but one uh, White House official also uh, flipped that around and said, well, maybe the decision by OPEC wasn't a political one, but the timing of it is definitely political because it will uh, put the Democrats, put Biden in a difficult position ahead of the midterms, and that it, if it had been a little bit delayed, it wouldn't have the same consequences. Uh, so you're seeing there that uh, the Americans, the White House, are acknowledging uh, that gas prices are part of the equation, but they would rather focus, of course, on uh, Russia and on what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, we have war in Europe, and I'm with Philippe Chalais, and also, thanks for joining us. Uh, Paris traffic could not keep him away. Uh, François Germain. Uh, Thank you. Good evening. The director of uh, Liège University's The Hugo Observatory and uh, a lead author on the UN's intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change. I'll begin uh, with you, uh, Philippe Chalais. Yes. Uh, first off, practically speaking, um, right now, price of oil, uh, on world markets, somewhere ab above or below ninety dollars a barrel. How how much does Vladimir Putin stand to gain by these production cuts? I would say that uh, finally the price of oil has not varied a at all uh, since the beginning of uh, two thousand and uh, and twenty two. Uh, remember that in January before the the war. The price of oil was around $100 per barrel. Uh, it exceeded 120 when the conflict starts, but after that, it's, rela it's be relatively uh, stabilization. Uh, remember also that uh, uh, the OPEC Plus uh, represents 55 percent of the world production. So uh, the decision of uh, decreasing a little bit the, the price, the, uh, the quota, uh, should not affect uh, very much uh, for me the, the price of oil. And uh, again, uh, I think that uh, we try to install this conflict between Saudi Arabia and uh, United States within the Ukrainian conflict. I think it's completely, uh, relatively disconnected. Is it disconnected? I we're talking it, about yeah. war and we're talking about a nuclear-powered country for, invading Ukraine. For, if, a, for a single reason. No, it's disconnected for a single reason. Oil is... Gas is very connected, oil is very disconnected. For a single reason is that oil can move everywhere on the planet as it wants, and uh, oil which is not sold at a, uh, to a country can be sold to, can be sold to another country. So it means that finally, uh, it's the reason why the war has relatively uh, reduced impact on the price of oil and on the global oil market. And it's also the reason why that uh, embargo go on oil is absolutely uh, inefficient compared because extremely different to to embargo on gas. François Germain, do you agree that there's a disconnect between what OPEC plus does and the war in Ukraine? Uh, I think at the moment it's difficult to say that there are some issues disconnected from each other. Uh, and it seems to me that everything is very much imbricated into each other because we see that there is a kind of domino effect and that basically what one side does has consequences for the other. Even though obviously uh, the flexibility of the distribution of oil is not the same as the one uh, for gas, for the simple reason that you'll need infrastructure for gas that you do not necessarily need uh, for oil. 
But what is really striking is that at the end of the day, uh, the winning power of all this is Russia, and that we are still so much rooted in fossil fuel energies, in oil and gas, that whatever we do, basically, as a winner, and that winner is Russia at the end of the day. At the end of the day, because of these price cuts? Because of these price cuts. So even though the price cuts might not be decided as a favor to Russia, at the end of the day, one of the side effects of the price cuts is that, indeed, it will bring additional revenue to Russia. So the problem is that even though we try to impose sanctions upon Russia, we are still so dependent upon oil and gas that at the end of the day, Russia will benefit from all of this. Or one day after welcoming the Emirati leader, uh, Vladimir Putin, speaking this Wednesday at an energy conference in Moscow. We want to be to keep on being partners with countries that deserve it. Russia has um, reached the same level of production as last year. And export volumes and production will remain in 2025 at about the same level as today. So there you have it. Uh, uh, Saman Ansari, what's your reaction when you hear Vladimir Putin saying, we're not isolated, we have partners, we have friends. Uh, a, a, does that, again, make OPEC plus nations uh, complicit uh, in this uh, invasion of Ukraine? Let me tell you something, Francois, and I'll be, and as you know, I'm a political analyst, independent one. Russia, we have a lot of differences with Russia. Russia is supporting the regime that threatens our existence, which is Iran. Does that mean we have to take a side to be against them in this specific uh, uh, case? Not necessarily, because you can use diplomacy to de-escalate. We don't need to escalate because that's a strategy that doesn't work. Escalate to de-escalate is not going to work. We need to work on de-escalating the issue and to, to prevent this uh, from going out of control. It's still under control. All what we are seeing is still under control. But even once... after the, the 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 bombing of urban centers that we've seen over the last uh, three days, look, wars are ugly. Wars are ugly. Wars are bad, and this is unjustifiable at all, whatsoever. And Saudi Arabia has voiced its rejection of that as well. But at the same time, we don't want this to escalate. So, is the solution for us to be just taking sides and just to? Uh, um, 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 try to do some kind of dramatic move in order for us to take sides. Not, it's not in the interest of Saudi Arabia. It's not in the interest of uh, the Arab world. And it's not in the interest of the energy market. And let's be very honest. Saudi Arabia is not a client state. It's not a client state. It's a nation that predates the U.S. and it's the heart of the Arab and Muslim world. And I think it will be a catastrophic mistake if the U.S. takes any measure against Saudi Arabia. It would be, I would call it the mistake of the century if the U.S. does something uh, against the interest of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The U.S.-Saudi relations, I'm a big believer in this relationship. It's the cornerstone of global security and economic prosperity. Mike Pompeo himself said that he can't imagine a world where there is no Saudi, where there's no Saudi-U.S. relations. So, and as I mentioned, the congressman from the Democratic Party, Adam Smith, uh, uh, and others. So. There are people who we can count on in the United States who know the value of this relationship and who actually appreciated us just two weeks ago about the move we did with mediating between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Even Zelensky, President Zelensky himself, thanked the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. But if Russia is not isolated, this war could last a long time. We know when wars start. We don't know when they end. Case in point, Yemen. Uh, is it in Saudi Arabia's interest, to perhaps, uh, yes, to take a little bit of a financial hit right now, uh, but to help isolate Russia and bring it to the table and to get it to withdraw troops? I, I, I think this is very simplistic to think that just pumping more oil will crash the oil uh, market. Saudi Arabia is already producing around 10.7 million barrels per day, and its maximum capacity in is In the 10. 1980s, Saudi Arabia, in alliance with the United States, helped squeeze Russia by pumping more oil and bringing the price of crude down when, when the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. Yeah, but that dynamics was completely different. Right now, you can't just work alone. You have to work with others. Right now, we are speaking of OPEC 
uh, plus more than 23 nations. And they are all working towards having stability for the oil and energy market. Trust me, the moment Saudi Arabia pumped more oil, maybe the prices will go. If it's going to go down, I'm just speculating without data, it might go down 10 percent. Would that make a big change? Not necessarily. So we have to find a way through which we can mediate between the conflicting parties instead of just adding uh, gas or adding um, gas to fuel that's what they call it um and and and, and i think uh, it's it's very doable for us in the international community and the kingdom of saudi arabia specifically to do something with regards to mediation because this can lead toward war and we should not be warmongers we should be there to make sure that we are there to de-escalate the issue before it gets out of our control. And it's going to be very catastrophic for all humanity. Let's just be realistic. Let's just be thinking uh, in the, uh, with, with, with some sanity, because the idea of just going uh, uh, and taking sides and going for to escalate this war and without knowing its consequences is going to be very catastrophic for all human beings. And we, we, we need to to, to, to prevent that from happening. Kedavan Gorgistani, what's the, the mood like in the United States when it comes to this? Uh, uh, Ukrainians would say that this is like, you know, 1938 in Europe, if you appease Vladimir Putin when he continues to advance on the battlefield. But there are those also who say we don't need more instability in more places. Well, I think uh, when it, it comes to uh, the Biden administration's uh, stance uh, against Russia and in support of Ukraine, uh, there is widespread uh, support, even bipartisan uh, support. One of the, the, the little and few things uh, that uh, you seem to have an agreement on here in uh, Washington, and even among the population, uh, the uh, latest uh, polls uh, really show that a big majority of Americans <coughs> are pretty uh, okay uh, with what uh, the Biden administration has been doing uh, towards uh, Ukraine, especially the support to Ukraine, but also uh, when it comes to really putting their foot down when it comes uh, to Russia. And I think uh, that uh, the Biden administration's uh, messaging towards Saudi Arabia comes from that, too, because uh, there again, there is a quite a bit of agreement here in Washington about uh, that there needs to be something done uh, with this relationship with Saudi Arabia. And he uh, was uh, really criticized. There was a heavy backlash uh, back in uh, the summer when he did that visit and he uh, had that fist bump uh, with MBS. Uh, he got criticized from both sides, the Democrats and the Republicans, uh, really uh, slamming uh, this sort of uh, trying to uh, reignite uh, the relationship and moving away from that campaign promise of making uh, Saudi Arabia a pariah state. So it looks like the Biden administration went uh, from a one swing of the pendulum uh, during uh, the campaign and in the early days of the Biden administration. Uh, then the pendulum swung to that fist bump. And now you're sort of seeing the Biden administration maybe uh, trying to figure out a middle ground uh, when it comes uh, to the Saudi relationship. And the war in Ukraine is simply crystallizing that because of how uh, strong uh, Joe Biden has been in his messaging uh, to counter Russia at all costs. Can you have a middle ground, Philippe Chalez, when it comes to Ukraine? Can you? I don't think so. Le, again, I think that the, it's really a, it's really a problem which uh, I repeat, but I think it's uh, relatively disconnected. In fact, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia wants to keep the price at the current level. Uh, Biden wants to for the price to to decrease because uh, the future election. So I think that the war is there finally. And uh, behind excuses, uh, I really think that the, the, the war of price is there. Uh, it's surprising that finally Biden doesn't need oil from uh, Saudi Arabia. 
practically with uh, with uh, shale oil and uh, their uh, uh, domestic production, the United <coughs> States is practically independent in terms of oil. Uh, so uh, I don't understand why the reaction is not more heavy in Europe. In Europe, effectively, uh, we import oil and we are very dependent, 100% uh, dependent uh, on oil. But we know that in Europe, the problem is not really oil. The problem is more gas and impact of gas on electricity. And so is the reason why, very probably, uh, European governments feel relatively uh, outside this fight between Saudi Arabia and United States. All right. I know that uh, Washington correspondent Kedavon Gorgistani has to uh, dash off to an assignment. So I want to thank you, Kedavon, uh, for being with us uh, I in this conversation. Um, François Germain, we heard uh, Salman al Ansari to tell us that times have changed. Uh, they, during the 1980s, uh, there was a different relationship. Back in 1991, when Saddam Hussein's Iraq invaded Kuwait, the then U.S. President George H.W. Bush deployed troops to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia used as a launch ramp for the Gulf War. Uh, Bush declared, quote, the sovereign independence of Saudi Arabia is of vital interest for the United States. And at the time, the kingdom cranked up oil production, which uh, was a huge hindrance to Saddam Hussein. Uh, your thoughts when you think of that bilateral relationship then and the bilateral relationship now? Well, it is clear that things have changed. And I think that we can say for sure that the visit of President Biden to Riyadh uh, a few months ago was clearly a fiasco. The, he, he took political risks with the hope to mend the relationship between the Saudis and the U.S., and obviously that didn't work. But what strikes me when you look at the, at the Gulf War, when you look at uh, the war in Afghanistan as well, is that basically the first report of the APCC came out in 1990. Uh, 32 years ago. For more than 30 years, we've known that we needed to get rid of fossil fuels as soon as possible. And we are here in 2022, still uh, at a time when we realize that who has the oil or the gas has the power. It is really striking that in all of our conversations lately, it's all about oil and gas. And it's quite striking to realize how much we are still dependent upon oil and gas, even though we've known for 30 years, for 30 years even, that we had to get rid of fossil fuels. And yet, we are still struck in uh, this conundrum where basically who has the fossil fuel has the power. Who has the fossil fuels has the power. And uh, we've seen Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine as Europe uh, uh, scrambling, turning down the thermostat, yes, to try to save energy. Uh, but also scrambling for alternate sources of energy, the construction of new liquefied natural gas terminals for imports, the courting of uh, producers uh, uh, from uh, all around, including the United States, as Philippe Chalez was saying. Uh, the most recent example of uh, uh, going in search of new uh, flows is the German chancellor, uh, who traveled uh, to Saudi Arabia and to Qatar. Uh, uh, and when you see those images, do you, François Germain, you talk about... Uh, 32 years ago and, and, and today, when you have the German chancellor uh, going to the Gulf, uh, do you make the distinction between the short term, getting through the next couple of winters, and the long term? Are we at a turning point or have we learned nothing? I think we've learned nothing. I mean, when I see the German chancellor begging, basically, authoritarian regimes uh, for gas, it literally makes me cry. Like, if we learned nothing about the need to anticipate this. When I see ministers in France wearing turtleneck jumpers and begging the citizens to set the thermostat at 19 degrees and to wear uh, turtleneck jumpers, that also makes me cry. I mean, there were many ways we could have anticipated this, and I'm afraid that we are into kind of short-term emergency measures that will further delay the energy transition, and yet we know that we should have done this energy transition years ago. No, I, I, I don't fully agree with you. I think that uh, the result today of our dependency on uh, Russian gas is also because wrong decision uh, in terms of uh, energy transition, especially uh, when you look at uh, the dependency on uh, Russian gas, it was 25% in 2010 and it's 45% today. And so, in fact, uh, we spent a lot, a lot of money on renewable 
uh, with disinterest uh, from uh, nuclear and uh, no investment in nuclear uh, practically over the, the last uh, 10 years and a huge investment in, uh, in renewable. And uh, the result, effectively, is that we increase our dependency on uh, But on, are we at a turning gas. point now with what's happening? The you heard François Gemin saying no. The turning point about... The turning point about dependency on the countries who control the oil and the gas. We are today with a dependency of 82%, I think, the, the fossil fuel represent 84. in the world. 80, well, it depends. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you mentioned uh, 1995. It was uh, probably 87. So yeah, uh, practically mean, the situation is the same. same. Alors, the situation is the same not only because uh, uh, we have not learned the past. It's also because it's extremely difficult to go outside fossil fuel because fossil fuel are extremely efficient in terms mm. of economic growth and so on. And, and because our economic the growth is as well. very dependent on, uh, on, uh, on fossil fuel. Uh, but we know today that uh, replacing uh, the gas from, uh, from Russia is extremely difficult because the volume are, are huge and it's impossible to find the volume uh, in other places because it has to be under the form of uh, uh, liquefied natural gas, no other option. And the volume of uh, mm -hmm. uh, liquefied natural gas are limited. A big part goes to uh, the South, uh, the Southeast uh, Asia, and so uh, the volume are limited, and it's the reason why we are obliged now to reduce uh, to reduce our consumption, and so uh, the ridiculous uh, measure we have heard last uh, last week uh, are, are correlated to are correlated to that. But so again, let's not be confused, and I fully agree with uh, uh, the intervenant from, uh, from Saudi Arabia, on oil market and gas market, it's completely different market. But and today we suffer essentially on a lack of gas, not on a lack of oil in Europe. But the, the turning point, Francois, would be, I think, for us to realize that our dependency on oil and gas puts us in a very dangerous situation from a geopolitical viewpoint in terms of peace and security. Uh, the problem is that for the moment, I only see emergency measures, uh, leaders begging uh, Gulf countries or even Venezuela for oil and gas, and I don't see long-term structural measures when it comes to investments in low-carbon energy or even energy renovation of buildings. I mean, that would be a long-term structural measures that could represent a turning point. It was not the... Uh, remember that uh, first, the first big crisis around oil was uh, 1973. Uh, so it was really a big mm -hmm. crisis, and uh, we recovered the problem we find today uh, in, uh, in this period. We had a real reaction. The reaction in France was to build a nuclear, and the nuclear decreased a lot our That's dependency uh, to oil and gas. But we completely changed the strategy uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and we see the result today. Salman Ansari, uh, that uh, Wall Street Journal article that we mentioned at the outset uh, said that uh, U.S. officials had warned uh, their counterparts uh, in Riyadh that uh, public mood is turning against big oil producers, whether it be the Russians or the Saudis, and even if a Donald Trump were to win re-election re in 2024... <coughs> It wouldn't be like it was in 2017 when his first foreign visit uh, was to Saudi Arabia. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's very clear for everyone right now that using Saudi Arabia as a scapegoat for the Biden administration's failing policies doesn't work anymore. And if the Biden administration wants to lower the cost of oil and gas, they simply should invest more in their refineries and to lower energy taxes and to also to stick to a reasonable long-term plan that can both help their transition to clean energy without harming their American energy consumers. So just using Saudi Arabia and putting it in the center of the talk when it comes to uh, the high energy prices is not going to help uh, anyone. And I think across the aisle in the United States, they know that. But Biden is just trying to use this for midterm election um, success. But I don't think it's going to uh, even work. 
and what's they going to do? Are they going to be in a position where they punish more than 23 nations just for uh, uh, the reason that they are trying to regulate the energy market? That's not going to be uh, sensible and it's not going to be achievable at all whatsoever. And they know that. Are they going to review those arms sales? Do you think that's going to happen? That's up to them. It's up to the Americans to do so. And Saudi Arabia has the whole world and it's a, it's a, it's a, a demand and a supply. So uh, weapons just like any other commodity. So it's not going to be Definitely, it's not going to be at the interest for the Saudi-US relations to have... Salman, kind of when you hear the conversation we're having here in Paris, uh, uh, finding the alternatives, being less uh, dependent for our energy security on, uh, on other powers, uh, talking about nuclear, talking about renewables, what's your reaction to that? My reaction to that, it's actually very good that the whole world is trying their best to move towards clean energy. And Saudi Arabia is... Uh, planning to do so. And they are actually planning to become the hub for uh, the green hydrogen, etc. And they have some uh, good deals with uh, Germany and other uh, nations around the world, Japan and South Korea. So we are m moving towards that as well. And we want to decrease our dependency on oil, even though we are the biggest oil uh, exporter in the world. So it is a good trend, but it should not be at the expense of the current uh, a situation right now in the world. You cannot just be having a switch and just go all the way to complete green energy because there's no such thing as such. We have to go gradually. We have to make sure that we are not in a position where we harm the nations that produce oil or the nations that need oil. And we are still having the hydrocarbon energy to be the most... Right. You're, you're talking about the, the planning to, 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 to make that switch to energy transition. Uh, here in Europe, for a younger generation, outrage with the pace with which an overheating planet is dealing with the climate emergency. Saudi Arabia recently fanning the flames of fury by bidding for and winning the rights to host the Asian Winter Games. Winter Games, that's in 2029. The desert venue, the Neon Mega Project, which has yet to uh, be uh, built. And uh, the thought of its carbon footprint uh, spooking uh, Olympic uh, French skiing medalist Alexis Pinturon. It's pretty unbelievable that this is happening today. Certain things are understandable, meaning that the West is very much ahead of the game on the issue of ecology, the fact that we have to start paying attention to many things like energy and consumption. Isn't it a bit of a Salman al Ansari, excuse me for being blunt, a, a public relations disaster because the carbon footprint will never be good on a project like that? Actually, OK, I'm not very specialized in this field, but I can tell you this. The thing that is very promising about Neum as a whole project, I don't know about the, uh, the, the Olympics, the Winter Olympics, is all going to be 100 percent energy, uh, uh, clean energy dependent. So that's in itself is very promising. Is that doable? We will see. But I think it is doable. And Saudi Arabia is having right now a project in the northern part of Saudi Arabia to have the biggest um, solar panels in the whole world. So they are trying to become not only the leader of energy, like the hydrocarbon energy, but also the clean energy. So that's very promising. Definitely, you'll be having some critics who might have some justifications for their ideas, but we still have time to, to, to see and assess uh, the situation in the future. But overall, I would love for the whole world to just be a little bit reasonable when it comes to climate change. You uh, should not push... Exactly. They should be reasonable in the sense that right. they should not push the whole world into a cliff just because they want to transfer or to transition from hydrocarbon to uh, clean energy. Let's do it gradually. Elon Musk, the guy of uh, e-cars, is the one who is actually saying so. So let's just be reasonable. And Fran not François, François Germain, your, your, your thoughts, let's, what was your reaction when you heard about the Asian Winter Games being awarded to Saudi Arabia? Well, as probably everyone, I was kind of shocked and, and flabbergasted and obviously the carbon footprint of this and of the NEON project as a whole will be huge and, and I think the message that is being said is, is disastrous. This being said, there is a little bit of a paradox here because the reason why Saudi Arabia 
is trying to diversify its economy, is trying to attract major sporting events like Formula One Grand Prix or Boxing Heavyweight Championships is because they're on the path to diversify their economy in the same way that Dubai, for example, has tried to become a tourist hub recently in the same way that Qatar is also hosting uh, the, 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 um, the World Cup uh, of soccer, which is also drawing heavy criticism. So we see on the one hand, countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates trying to diversify their economy in a move basically to try and face down the importance of fossil fuels on their GDP. And on the other, on the other hand, this is at the cost of an immense carbon footprint for the Asian Games in 2029 or for the World Cup uh, this winter. Is the resentment uh, <clears throat> um, uh, that uh, they're talking about in the United States and perhaps among some of your students, is it about cl climate change issues or is it about human rights? Is it about the war in Yemen? I think both. And I think for a long time, these issues have been disentangled for each other, from each other. And now we realize that they are deeply entangled with each other. And this is also... I would say the background of the new geopolitics after World War in Ukraine, uh, it is that oil producing countries usually tend to be oil and gas uh, producing countries also tend to be authoritarian regimes and that these issues have become increasingly entangled. Uh, and I think that we are kind of blindsided I'm in our idea. There is, as Philippe Charles, the United States. I mean, yeah. they're big oil and gas producers. I know, I know. And we are, we are a little bit blindsided, I think, in a European view that Russia would be isolated on the world stage. Russia is not as isolated as it seems from Europe. It has a strong backing in Africa or in Asia. And we'll see in, a bit, in about three weeks from now at COP27 what the new geopolitics of climate change will also look like. And, and I suspect that the unified front of cooperation will not look the same as it looked at COP26. You, uh, Philippe Charles, you heard Salman Ansari say we want to avoid uh, an, uh, an escalation that leads to a world war. Are, economically speaking, I know militarily we're not in a world war, but economically speaking, are we already in one? Economically speaking, uh, we were already before the before the the war of uh, the war of Ukraine. Uh, but I think that. Uh, and when I say world war, I mean that <coughs> you're putting. Uh, defeating your adversary above financial profit interests i think so that uh, we are in a, in a, in a certain uh, in a certain war but uh, uh, coming back to the to give you uh, some uh, impression about uh, this uh, uh, completely crazy project i i agree that uh, this project is completely crazy it's not only i think a question only of uh, of uh, of economics it's also a question of image oh yeah uh, remember uh, uh, i remember in the in the 90s uh, abu dhabi had already built a ski slope in uh, in abu dhabi uh, remember also the the olympic the the, the last uh, winter olympic game in china it was also absolutely crazy in terms of uh, because uh, it was practically only artificial so artificial will, the, will the world cup in qatar help force the issue no no i don't or will but people just care will, about football it will help the qatar for uh, its image and uh, to have another image effectively of uh, uh, oil and gas but uh, uh, probably it improved the image in terms of uh, uh, world opening but i agree with you that in terms of uh, uh, image for the, the future of climate is absolutely a disaster, of course. Once the whistle blows on the first match, no one will be talking anymore about these issues? No, I think, this, I think the players will be talking, and I expect that there will be some strong political gesture also in the course uh, of, of the competition. And, and I also think that uh, Qatar thought that it would be a really good PR operation. I'm not so sure that it will be a great PR operation for Qatar at the end of the day. That will all depend also on the behavior of the players on the pitch, I think. I'm afraid that when uh, people will be in front of the French team looking at the television, they will extremely rapidly forget that uh, the World Cup is in Qatar. We will see. I, I we'll would see. be surprised if the viewership was as high as for the latest World Cups. All right, we'll see. Well, the proof will be in the pudding. François Germain, I want to thank you. I want to thank you as well. Philippe Charles, Salman Al Ansari, many thanks for joining us from London. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.